Okay, we've got five plus two. So um, I'm going to start uh, you know, with a small group. It can be quite informal. Um, I put these training slides together um, brief recently, but we've done um, a lot of thinking about this problem and there's going to be a lot of thinking still to go. So um, I'm going to start with a bit of background. So this is the Nazareth facility, which is the Expo Showground Center in Johannesburg. And um, one of the halls, I think it's this one, hall, uh, it's gate five, which is here, um, and hall six, I think, or hall five, which is this one, has been was commissioned by the Housing Department of Health a while ago to act as uh, some kind of field hospital for uh, patients with COVID. And um, this is what, sort of what a hall looks like, these huge halls on the inside. And I, I don't have a picture of how it's set up now, but there are some online. Um, and the hall has, uh, it now has 600 beds in it. Each bed has a locker, uh, a table and a chair. And there are actually 50 beds, which are in, in single isolation rooms. So 550, which are kind of laid out in long lines with a few divisions. Um, and then a small area with 50 beds, which are en suite. Um, so people could go in there if they did not have a confirmed diagnosis of COVID. Um, so the 600 beds. So as somebody um, said to me yesterday, oxygen is the, is the new currency. Certainly when you're dealing with COVID as a healthcare professional, the new currency is essentially oxygen. And um, they commissioned these beds without any oxygen. Um, and the idea was that they, patients could go there for uh, when they were basically better or if they didn't ever get to the point of needing oxygen, they could go there and they would not, they would therefore not be infecting people in their own home. So essentially people who are unable to self-isolate at home could, could go there. Um, I think it's clear, it was always clear really that, that is not the great need. The great need is actually for oxygen. So currently they have about 160 160 people in this facility. Uh, many of them are probably not very infectious anymore anyway. Um, and they have a very limited number of doctors. They've got, um, currently they've got two Cuban doctors who are literally only there four hours a day um, and they don't speak English. So that's a problem. And they've got, I think, one medical officer and they've got about 18, 18 nurses um, for these beds. So they can do very little. Um, as I said, indicated here, there is a plan, and, and the Minister of Health tweeted this today or yesterday um, to confirm it, that they are commissioning a new 1,000 1, beds at Nazareth. And those 1,000 beds will have piped oxygen up to 15 litres a minute. Um, and that is apparently is happening. Um, and that's ideal. Um, we remain to be, it's supposed to be finished in 30, 30 days. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will happen, and even if it is, whether the appropriate staff will be recruited to fill those beds. But the soonest it can possibly be ready is 30 days, although that does seem unlikely. So, um, you know, working on the on the front line, uh, Helen Joseph, as I have been, and in the clinics, and I'm sure many of you are well, well aware of this, that in Hateng now we've got. Um, over 6,000 cases a day. Um, the doubling rate is about every eight days. So Sorry? So we could easily have 12,000 cases a day, 10 or 12,000 cases a day by this time next week. Um, and the hospitals are already full. Anyone who's worked in them is trying to move patients around can see that the, the hospitals, the private and the public hospitals, are, are, are completely full and people are suffering because they can't get any oxygen. So um, myself and, and a few other people uh, have gathered together and we see this as a, as a healthcare emergency um, that we've got patients, we've got patients who need oxygen, we've got no beds with oxygen. And yet we do have um, 450 empty beds at Nazareth with all many of the things that you do require for an oxygenated bed, i.e. a bed, um, and waste management, and food for the patients, and food for the staff, and um, 
an ambulance. So many of the things that are required are there, but two things aren't. One is oxygen itself, and the other is enough staff to man the facility. And so we were able to negotiate with NASREC essentially, well, not NASREC itself, but with, with the Department of Health essentially, to, for them to say, okay, you can have, uh, you can use up to 150 of these beds um, as, as a sort of uh, conscientious exercise to try and um, to try and make some oxygen beds. Um, so this is not a government uh, endeavor by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually a group of clinicians and healthcare providers who, recognizing the shortfall in what the government has done, is trying to fill a gap and the aim of saving some lives. So that's that's what it is. Um, if everything went to to plan, it would only need to exist for 30 days, because then these other beds would become available. But I think that is quite unlikely to be true. So, so that's the background of who, of who we are. I, I'm uh, infectious disease doctor, Helen Joseph. My wife, Lynn Wilkinson, works for International AIDS Society. And um, we're sort of coordinating this, and we've had input from, from other people. So um, the reason, and, and much of this was in, in the documents that were sent to you, but I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, the main intervention, as I, as I said, would be to supply oxygen. Um, so the two missing things I said are oxygen and, st and staff. So uh, earlier this week, or the end of last week, Lynn and I and others um, started on a process of trying to get hold of oxygen and staff. And you are the very kindly the staff um, who've agreed. Um, we sort of pulled the trigger, as it were, on this, saying it would start on today, actually, on Friday. Um, because we'd been promised by an uh, oxygen concentrator person that he could rent us 25 machines, um, then they could be delivered on Thursday. And that person reneged on that. It wasn't actually true. It was a business person, a salesman, and actually he didn't actually have 25 concentrators. And so we've been phoning around oxygen firms all day, all of yesterday, um, and we think we've now managed to locate the first 10 machines. And um, it looks like we may be getting paid for by the Solidarity Fund. So those are 10 five meter machines. Uh, the reason we can't have piped oxygen in is, is that it wouldn't be possible, it would take too long and it wouldn't be possible because of the infection risk to pipe oxygen into those, that area because it's full of patients with COVID. Right so the options are oxygen concentrators or oxygen tanks. And oxygen tanks, um, a huge number of them, um, to, to deliver five liters a minute for 24 hours, you need one full-size tank, and you need the regulators, which are in short supply. And so tanks are really this not a good option. Um, I've discussed this with a number of people, including the MSF team in Kailicha, who are running a 60-bed field hospital, and they were very strongly, it's very strongly advised that we should use, if we want to do this, we should use concentrators rather than and tanks. So that's what we've got. So that's kind of where we are at this point. Um, so the aim is, um, I've got, got one, but we've got two things holding us up at the moment. One is the, the person who is the manager of NASREC um, wants us to start on Monday. Um, and I'm trying to go around him to get to let us start tomorrow because 48 hours might not sound long but it does it's a long time if you're sitting in a corridor with no oxygen um we would like to start immediately um so i can't at this very moment say we're definitely starting tomorrow morning because i'm still waiting on that okay um and again lynn is behind me on the phone trying to finally get these ox these oxygen concentrators so I'm, I'm hoping we'll start tomorrow morning and I'll, t and I'll keep everyone updated on the group. So are there any questions? Maybe it's a reasonable time to stop before I start talking about 
Um, and, and I will be covering the staff requirements. I'll be covering the kind of patients that will be admitted. I'll be covering the procedures. Um, so you know, there's a lot more to go, but are there any questions just on the background? I don't see anyone unmuting. So I'm going to assume that everyone's kind of happy with the background. Yeah, no, everything's good. Uh, thank you for that. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so what do we need to set up? So we're going to need, so that they have, like I said, these Cuban doctors who are not there very much, and but we are going to have to have a doctor or a clinical associate on site 24-7, at least one, because if something, you know, we're going out a little bit on a limb here, um, and if something goes wrong and we don't have somebody on board, then we could easily find ourselves in hot water and be shut down, and that would be very much to the detriment of patients. So um, we that that is uh, the minimum. Um, there will be, depending how much buy-in I get from the manager there, um, how I'm trying to maintain my relationship with the manager, but at the same time trying to start tomorrow. Um, he said that he can. Some of his nurses can be used for these extra beds because they you know, they have actually enough nurses. You know, they're, they're mostly empty, so they do have some. But to have extra nurses and, and ENAs um, would be extremely valuable. So they're very much valued um, to help with this. I would I would envisage a flat hierarchy with um, <clears throat> um, doctors and nurses performing similar tasks to some to some degree. Um, and um, nurses would be extreme, and ENA is extremely valuable. In terms of what's there, so I said, uh, essentially everything is provided for these non-oxygen beds, everything that you would need. Um, staff changing rooms, PPE, um, places to take off your PPE, uh, meals, they do uh, certainly two meals, I think three meals a day, um, parking, security, um, somewhere to sit down and relax, um, so pretty much most things are, are already there, which is why you know, we chose to try and use an aspect rather than set up our own facility. Um, um, so uh, uh, in terms of the staff, it'll be a little bit movable, but like I said, that, that's a min there's a minimum setting for the staff, but the more staff we have, the, the better. And you know, we, as I said, we would start small, literally 10, we probably, if we start tomorrow, we'll admit probably five patients tomorrow, another five on Sunday, and build up and, and you know, uh, face challenges as they come up. But who, the question is, who would we admit? And it's going to be low, relatively low acuity patients because it isn't a hospital. Um, even the one in Cape Town at the CTICC, um, that one does have things like x rays and, and blood tests. Um, but we think that's too high, to, something to aim for right now. So the patients will be, firstly, they'll have their COVID diagnosis confirmed. So they're going to be coming from the three big hospitals initially. So Helen Joseph, Bar Krasani Barakwanath, mm -hmm. and Charlotte McClake, the three Johannesburg hospitals that they're going to initially. And the aim, there, therefore, is to free up a bed um, so they can admit somebody from their casualty into a bed. Um, the patients that we'll take will be the easiest of their patients, but still requiring oxygen. So it'll be somebody who is able to, who can manage on, with five liters a minute, their SATs are 90% or above, but they still require, because they're still low, they still require oxygen. Um, and they really have to have very, else, very little else wrong with them for us to be able to take them. Um, we won't be able to give intravenous fluids or intravenous medication. Won't be able to do blood tests. Won't be able to do X-rays. Won't be able to do advanced nursing. We won't have the facilities or the equipment to do things like room care and catheter care and things like that. They'll have to be a normal level of consciousness, no psychiatric or gross sensory disturbance. Um, and I've just and I'm in close contact with people at each of those three hospitals, and they're they're very happy that they have plenty of patients who who fit this uh, fit this mold. Okay, they've been in hospital for a little while. They're, they're getting, they're coming right. Um, they, they definitely got COVID, but they still need, um, let's say, three to five days of oxygen before they can be discharged. And so they're sitting in the hospital with, you know, requiring very little. And so if we take 
those patients away, then they can use their x-rays or their extra doctors, their blood tests, etc., to to work on some slightly more complicated patients. So um, that's who we would be admitting. And, and as I said, I've been, I've been reliably informed that there are plenty of these patients available. So what are we going to do for them? So number one, so there are really four treatments that work in, in, um, in COVID-19. Um, and those are the first four on the list there. Um, two of them, the level of evidence is the same as for a parachute. There's no randomized controlled trial, but you wouldn't jump out of an airplane without a parachute. And that's the level of evidence. So for oxygen supplementation and awake proning, um, those are generally considered um, very important. Awake proning means lying somebody on their front, on their stomach or on their side. Um, and it uh, um, improves the um, ventilation perfusion matching in the lung. And there are num actually a number of observational publications showing a dramatic increase in oxygen saturations from literally from 50 to 80 or 70 to 90 when you just um, turn someone from their back onto their front. So um, oxygen initially at five liters per minute, we're looking to get 10 liters per minute. So we could take people who need a little bit more oxygen. Um, awake proning as necessary. They may not need it, but if they do, it's available. The, the one treatment with a very good evidence from a randomized controlled trial is steroids. And the doses I've given, I've given there for 10 days, um, that's, that's beyond doubt. And the fourth treatment is anticoagulation. Um, is anticoagulation. Um, we're still awaiting trials on anticoagulation, but it's become very clear, again, this parachute type of evidence has been very clear that patients with COVID becoming highly prothrombotic. And um, there are high, um, high incidence rate of pulmonary embolus and DDT. And um, everyone, is, everybody really is, is of a consensus that anticoagulation is necessary. What isn't clear is the exact dose. Um, at least uh, 40 milligrams uh, per day as a prophylactic dose. And there's a lot of debate and a lot of research going into whether patients require high doses. But we're not going to get bogged down in that just to say that, that that's a, the active area that we're, we're looking into. And we'll be following guidelines of the Cape Town people who are a couple of months ahead of us, so they have a lot of experience to guide us on that. And then of course, people, many of these people require chronic medication. Many will be hypertensive, diabetic, HIV, um, and they'll require their chronic medication. Um, and that's essentially what we'll be able to provide for them in a, in a medical sense, apart from nursing and food and, and warmth and things. Um, in terms of where we'll get all of that from, so like I said, we'll be spreading the oxygen in these concentrators. All the other medications will need to come from the hospital. So I'll talk a bit more about how patients who envisage people coming to us, but they will, um, they, they will come with a TTO, basically. So 14 days of or whatever is required to finish 10 days of steroids and 14 days of Clexane, 14 days of chronic medication at, a, at the very minimum. Um, and we'd be able to, most of the patients would be able to self-administer the oral part of that. And we would be administering the Clexane. Um, what do I envisage in terms of monitoring? I think by far the most important monitoring test is oxygen saturations. And we have oxygen saturation machines. And I would envisage taking saturations six hourly. So a pulse and saturation and titrating the oxygen. And we're looking to maintain SATs above 90. Um, and also, obviously, we're looking to get people out of hospital. So if their SATs are uh, dramatically above 90, then we can turn down the oxygen a little bit. If they're below 90, then we can turn it up. And if it's at the maximum, then we can initiate proning to try and keep the SATs above 90 as best we can. Um, I don't envisage blood pressure and blood sugar being um, hugely important. Pay, pay, People who have very unstable blood pressure or sugars shouldn't be coming. Um, those things need to be stable. Um, so there'll be no sliding scales and nobody with, with very high blood pressure. So um, I don't envisage blood pressure being dramatically important. Temperature also not particularly important. It doesn't really change what we do. Someone has a high fever, but their saturations are fine. We're not really going to change much. So those may be nice to have, but they're, they're not the key, the, the key to this. Um, 
So some patients will get better and they'll go home. They'll, they'll get onto zero oxygen and we'll discharge them home. Um, but some will deteriorate and uh, that's inevitable. Although they, you know, they'll be stable when they arrive, um, some will deteriorate. And there are a number of reasons why patients deteriorate. Um, one is, there's really four reasons that people deteriorate. I think the big four, at least, you know, when people have had COVID for a week or so, they've been in hospital for a few days or a week, and they deteriorate for about, mostly for four reasons. One is that their COVID gets worse. It's purely the COVID. Um, the other is that they have pulmonary embolus, which is common. Um, they also have organizing pneumonia, which is an, an immune reaction. And they, they get worse about seven to 10 days with organizing pneumonia. And they also would obviously be prone to hospital acquired pneumonia. I think that would make up the, the biggest four. And um, we will make sure that the, the, the hospital which is sending the patient has made a clear escalation plan um, before they come to us, signed by a consultant. Um, and again, a lot of this is up for review. Um, may need to be, will need to be adapted. But essentially, the patient would go back to the hospital they came from, and they would have an obligation to prioritize that person because that's, you know, it's a quid pro quo. We'll take their patient, the patient, but they have, um, and they can always swap a patient, you know, a sick one for a less sick one. Um, and they need to tell us, would this patient be considered for high care or ICU? So if they deteriorate, are they a candidate for ventilation or hypernasal oxygen? If they are, great. If they're not, there may be other reasons that they may need to go back to hospital. For example, we were, you know, would, would they be candidate to go back for a chest X-ray, perhaps a pulmonary angiogram, or something unrelated to their chest, like a surgical review, um, and that they may, or they may not be considered to return to hospital under any circumstances. Uh, in which case we would uh, provide palliative care, and that's something that which would grow. Um, so um, those are the, again, as I said, these are adaptable and they, they could change, but a lot of this is in line with what other hospitals are doing. So we, we would have a clear plan. And if they said this patient is not to return under any circumstances, that's not to say we couldn't phone them and discuss it, but um, probably, you know, this will be signed off and, and we would do the best we could to keep that person comfortable. Um, someone's going to ask me about provision of palliative care drugs, and that is a very good question. Um, we do not have a right this very second um, palliative care drugs available, but I think that is something that we would need, we will need to look at very quickly so that we can keep it when this is, you know, perhaps in the first five patients, everything will be fine. But you know, if we do get up to larger numbers, then palliative care is going to become more, um, more important, I think. Um, discharge planning, so who goes home? This is from the national guidelines. Um, we won't be having asymptomatic patients. We'll mostly be having mild patients. So de-isolation is 14 days after onset of symptoms. And so um, if somebody does not require oxygen before they get to that point, then we could move them over into the other part of Nazareth. Well, it's the same hall, but the other section, which is the non-oxygen section and to complete their 14 days, or if they're able to isolate at home to complete their 14 days, they could do that. And then below is, is people who've had more severe disease, and it would be possible that people who had had severe, more severe disease would be able to um, come to Nazareth. But that would be less likely because they probably have needs that we can't currently give, which are things like physiotherapy um, um, and perhaps social support, which at the moment we're, we're just trying to keep people alive. This is, uh, there are no lines on it, but this is the, the kind of form that I'm suggesting that the that their patient comes with. So all of their demographics, their confirmed COVID state, their, the date that they can be de-isolated. De um, comorbidities, we want to know. Medications, we want to know. We want to know when they started their steroids so we can, and what they, which one they were on. We want to know what clexane dose was chosen for them and it's likely to be 40 milligrams a day, what their oxygen requirements are and the saturations on that oxygen so we have a baseline. The respiratory rate, unfortunately, is done extremely badly and, but is extremely useful. Um, and I, I always do respiratory rate myself and I, I would encourage people to do that, but they may not. 
um, pulse rate, blood pressure, and GCS, which, should, which must be 15, otherwise they shouldn't be coming. Then the escalation plan with the consultant signature and just a bit of a checklist in the referring doctor. Um, I'm sure I've missed lots of things, um, so I'll put this together fairly quickly. Um, but I'd like to open the floor to anyone who'd like to ask any ask any questions. Do I need to unmute you? This isn't so unmuted. So yeah. I'm sure I've missed things, um, undoubtedly. So please um, feel free to ask any questions, and I'll see what I can do to answer. Um, Francis, you've got your hand up. Yes. Hi, Tom. Thank you very much for that. Um, can you say what the PPE gear is and will we be able to change there? Um, and a, a bit of detail about that. So yes. in general practice, we haven't been wearing full PPE at this stage. So can you speak a little bit about it? Sure. So they have a very good supply of, of PPE. They have a, ch a changing room um, with lockers and um, a good supply of PPE and um, people are wearing actually more than is, generally they're wearing more than is recommended. At the minimum um, is really to, you know, it's, we're not trying to protect the patients from each, each other as we were in, are in like some situations. We're just trying to protect ourselves or the staff from COVID and that really is gonna get into your body through your mouth, nose and eyes. So if you're wearing an N95 mask and a visor, then that is, that is the majority of the protection. Um, but there are also gowns, gloves, um, foot That's coverings and hair coverings, which are not in all of the guidelines, but um, people are tending to wear those. So they're actually wearing very high level PPE, slightly more than is technically required. And that's all available in abundance. Good, thank you, thank you. I would recommend, there's a lot of debate, probably worth coming on to this debate about airborne um, travel, uh, airborne dissemination. I think it's very clear that um, the dichotomy between droplet spread and airborne spread is not, it's not quite as clear cut as people once thought. Um, and definitely if you were in a, um, a crowded space without masks on with no ventilation, then uh, there's definitely airborne transmission, although it's not the predominant mode by any means. Um, but in an area like Nazareth, where you've got a high concentration of people with confirmed COVID, I think it's sensible to use an N95 mask. Um, Tom, I think Ty, yes. Ty's got his Yeah, um, Tom, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I think this is a very worthwhile effort. I'm sorry I, mi I missed the first five minutes. Maybe you can just give us an indication. What number of patients, um, what number of patients do you anticipate? And then of those that are admitted, um, how many do you think will actually demise and uh, yeah. require either palliation or return to tertiary hospital care? Yeah, that's a really can you good manage our, Can you help us manage our ex expectations, please? Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. And I, I, haven't, have to, I have to be honest with you, and I haven't asked myself that question very hard yet. But, but I, think, I think you can. In fact, uh, the, the objective is to get the hospitals, the big hospitals, sending us patients, and that's going to be a predominant focus, sending us patients that are on a path to recovery. So the likelihood of having patients who die on us is less than, uh, you, know, than you would expect the, the mortality to be in the hospital. So we'd be seeing probably better um, scenarios, uh, but you must remember that a patient can come and then suddenly deteriorate. So we, we may just see some of these yeah. sudden deteriorations, but I think in the main, you can be seeing people on the path to recovery. Yeah, so if you, if you, we were looking at the numbers from the Cape Town Center, for just as an example, and they're taking sicker patients than this. They've got bigger oxygen supplies and sicker patients. And they've admitted, I think it was in the six to 800 num numbers, and they'd had about, I think they'd, only about 15 had returned to care. And I can't remember the number that had died, but it was well under 50 wasn't a huge number and their patients were significantly sicker than the ones we were expecting. So I'm thinking it's relatively small. And the days in Cape Town are actually about four and a half days they presented today. The average stay in their center is four and a half days, mm -hmm. something from two to about 11 days. So you, you'd expect people to come there by ambulance and the challenge is of course then to get them home, uh, which they presented as the bigger problem. 
-hmm. I think there's another question about um, resource facilities and then security requirements. Maybe I can just deal with this security requirements. Um, Tom, I just had a conversation with uh, Mrs. Morewane. I tried to get a hold of, um, of uh, this, but he's not answering. Uh, mm -hmm. And I told her that she needs to, she's his boss, um, mm -hmm. that he needs to facilitate, uh, you know, the visit tomorrow or the start tomorrow. Uh, there's right. some issues and I think that may be a constraint. So she sent me some numbers. Firstly, they do not want to allow anyone there without signing forms uh, by the department that are done by the HR around uh, um, liability issues. Uh, what's this form? I forget every time. Um, that, that basically d disclaimers or something. Uh, but mm -hmm. essentially that they need signed. And I told her, can the HR guy come tomorrow? And she says, not sure. So she sent me the number. I'm waiting for it. Um, the donations as well, uh, Tom, uh, she turned around and told me these have to be vetted somehow by the MEC's office, which I'm really not sure, but we can probably push that along uh, um, if we need, if this doesn't bother with it. But I think the question of security requirements, it's actually at NASREC. So you just drive up to gate five and the guard will let you in. We'll probably have to give people some sort of, uh, you know, list at the clinic door. Um, and, and allow them or that, that uh, entrance and you'd be able to come in. So it's really quite easy. There's plenty of parking. It's pretty safe, um, easy to get to. Um, so I think it's, a, it's, 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 it's really an easy place to work in. I think the challenges are what's, you, what's happening in the clinical space, so to say. So we, and I want to suggest, uh, Tom, that while we may not actually start, let's see what the results are from Mrs. Moriwani's call but I think that if we can ar arrange to take people on just a tour and orientation, a lot of their okay. problems would be dealt with because they'd see and they'd answer it for themselves. And I think this would be much better than online. So if we go there tomorrow, <laughs> let's say nine o'clock and we arrange and we can just go in small groups so it's not a big bundle and then just uh, get some sort of orientation to the facility and simple questions asked like these. I think the bigger question is more I think what you're doing is orientating people to the clinical challenge, which I think is a problem and you need to be fairly familiar with it. And I think like Thomas said, we have no idea. It's a feel, you know, like you grow up in the dark. It's pretty much that same feel. You may not know what you've got your hands on, but we're going to have to feel our way then to figure things out. So there's a very strong element of learning on, on our feet, literally. So I think uh, Tom, the question is resource facilities. I think, you know, we we have that estimation. I imagine they are. Not Tom, have you any idea that there's, uh, you know, at least we can do intubations, I imagine. Not sure whether they've got emergency trolleys or anything like that yet. No, well, no. Um, I think the, the key to this is to be picking up deterioration early and uh, sending people, that there is an ambulance station there. So uh, the ambulance can actually, ambulance people can actually intubate somebody and um, and take them as an emergency. So. If it came to that, that that is available. I think the key is to pick up a deterioration early and send them back early if they're for escalation of care. Um, and uh, I think CPR is a no-no. I just don't even go there. If, nobody's going to survive CPR. Um, it, return of, they're not going to accept an ICU. They're not going to survive. So I, I don't think this is a facility that offers CPR. I think if somebody deteriorates, like I said, we ideally send them work before they need intubation. Um, if not, then the AMS is available in that circumstance. But if somebody has no pulse, then I think they've died. Richard wants to ask something. Richard? I do. Thank you. Um, colleagues, yeah, my name's uh, Richard Cook. I'm with uh, Family Medicine at WITS. Um, Yes, I, I think I think volunteers, uh, well, all of us, uh, will be will be reassured that that this, the the approach to this exercise to this project is is very one uh, very much one of collaborative learning and teamwork within the context of this space. Um, it's not going. We're not going to be setting anything up that um, that where people are going to be feeling that they're working on their own, that they've got nowhere to turn to, that they're going to have to deal with things. Um, outside of any 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 team and any collaborative approach, I think that's to to, to we, we can learn from what the approach that they've had in Cape Town around hosting 
um, regular meetings around hosting collaborative um, learning conversations that they've termed, how they've termed it. Um, and so I, I think that, that volunteers will be, will be reassured for, for, that, for that approach. And we look forward to everyone contributing to our, our collective growth in this. Because it is, they are going to be negative outcomes, but, um, but really it's, it's, about, it's about how we, we collectively are, are working together in this space. Thanks, colleagues. Yeah, if I may, Tom, I, I think also, please, um, we are not going in the <laughs> feeling that we are going to be taking responsibility for an entire 600 to 500 beds. Yeah. Going in there, I think Tom has been deliberate about it. Okay. Opa, if you don't mind just muting yourself. Um, we, we basically are going to take up the beds that can be managed by whoever's available. And so it's going to be very moderated. We're going to say, here's a standard by which we work and let's manage the beds we can manage. So I think it's going to be a very practical where the group is going to say, all right, you know what, we have capacity, we can manage five beds, we then we manage five beds. Uh, let's make it very much determined by the collective that is around the table. And if you cannot do more, you cannot do more. And I think these are some of the, 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 you know, the processes that we're going to have to unfold. So we don't need to feel that as a group, we're going in there and taking on the entire world's problems on our shoulders. We're doing what we can do. Ty, you had your hand up. Maybe you want Hi. to You're muted. Ty, I think you've... Apologies, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what do you see the ratio of staff to patients? Um, I, I can't really tell from your initial provisional roster whether they're going to be two, uh, two staff per 150 beds now. And if so, how, how, how frequent do you expect the patient interaction to be and how intense? And um, is there going to be a, a possibility of, of, of making notes? Uh, is there going to be, yeah, well, how does it, the logistics and the administration work between doctors or nurses and the patients? Yeah. So I would envisage, so it certainly won't be two staff to 150. So I put, I put up to 150 just to, to, you know, to tell you what our, our grand plan would be. Um, at the moment, we're looking at going up to 30, 30 um, of these low acuity patients. Um, and remember that our staff to help with feeding um, the patients um, should be able to walk to the bathroom um, and there are nurses from that are already employed who can be part of this. Um, I envisage from a medical point of view um, yeah so um, so I'm just getting some information from Lynn. So what we're aiming for is two doctors and four nurses per shift which I think for 30 patients of low acuity is, is plenty. Um, in terms of uh, monitoring them, I, 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 you know, I've, I've, I've seen a few patients a few world rounds now, and really what I'm interested in is how much oxygen they're on, how much, what their SATs are on that oxygen and what their respiratory rate is. I'm not that interested in their temperature um, and their blood pressure, really. And, and then I want to titrate my oxygen. I obviously want to make sure they have the, the other medication, the, the um, chronic meds, the steroids in there. Plexane, and then if somebody does deteriorate, then then obviously you can see them more intensely. But um, they, they should not be high intensity. You know, if they were in Helen Joseph Hospital, they'd probably get seen once a day by a doctor, and they might have their vitals done a couple of times. Um, um, and I think we'll just have to see how it goes. I think I, personally, I'll be there myself like, quite a lot of the time in the first few days and weeks, and I'll be anxious about missing something. Um, and so perhaps we'll overdo it to begin with, um, but that's fine. I'll be there doing it. So. If you think most, most hospital patients get seen once a day by a doctor, and at weekends often they don't get seen um, unless something goes wrong. And so I think we, we can easily supply, you know, these are, and we're now talking about less sick patients. So I think we're going to be able to cope with that quite easily. Um, did I say that? Two doctors and four nurses is what I said per shift. It will be need, less will be required at night. Night is 
I would so I would envisage the night. The night. So we've got one. We, we've got Lynn is sorry. Lynn is here. Is doing all the hard work. Um, she really is, and she's putting together the roster. We've actually got one doctor, one clinical associate, and two nurses at night, which is a lot. It's really a lot. Um, and you know, if you think about that, that could be, with those numbers, you could easily go up to sixty beds. Um, a night, you know, the patient should be asleep, and I would imagine the, the staff can sleep to some degree as well on the night shifts. We wouldn't obviously wouldn't be doing admissions and discharges um, on the night shift, just emergencies. Tommy, if I can suggest, I don't know. There don't seem to be many more questions. Um, can I ask that we think about how we take this forward? Um, where, are, where are things at in terms of the roster that you're referring to Lynn having prepared? Um, and just look at this question of whether we kind of take this forward, given the challenges that we look at Monday, tomorrow, and Sunday, that we get people to visit and orient themselves a bit more, and actually sit down and discuss the the broader issues and see where we are in progress uh, tomorrow and Sunday at, uh, you know, if we can pick a time and then let other people know, listen, you can come there and you can be part of that discussion. But we also do a deliberate walk around to get people understanding things better. Uh, do you think that will work fine? We definitely want to do that. I think we'll communicate those things. So Lynn, like I said, Lynn's working very hard on the roster. Um, she will send out a revised roster imminently. And, um, like I said, I'm just waiting on this okay from the manager there. And we can certainly do a walk around. And again, we'll communicate this on the group, a walk around um, tomorrow and Sunday potentially um, so that people can get a feel for what's happening. It should be as on, on another call. Does that, does that sound reasonable to everyone? Yeah, is it? Sorry, I didn't catch that. So we we're looking at uh, a time. Did you figure a time out? We're gonna. I think we'll communicate it on the WhatsApp group. All right. Um, we will. Um, you know, because we've only got a few people on this call anyway. And yeah. then put together a roster, which she'll be sending out very shortly. Right. And then we'll communicate. Um, if there's a larger meeting where we do a walk around, then we'll communicate that on the WhatsApp. Group. Okay, I've just got the HR person's number, so we'll see if we can get him to join us tomorrow. And uh, if he if he does come out, uh, Moriwane seemed rather reluctant about whether he would come out. So let's just see from there. So um, I think that would be fine. And in terms of um, other people, we don't always only only need to have clinicians there. There might be other people who think they could add value. Can we we'll meet personally there so that we can in fact have a, a broader discussion about other things that they could contribute to? Well, let's take, let's, I think we'll take that offline for now. Okay. That's fine. Give me a call. We'll chat about this a little later. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If no more questions, or we'll uh, we'll sign off. Thanks very much for everyone for their volunteering. One, appreciate it. one yeah. question, please. Can can you send the? Uh, can you post the uh, presentation? Your presentation on the WhatsApp group, please. Yeah, and I think it should be as, as um, recorded. It. Oh, oh, just these slides. The presentation. Yes, yes, slides. Please. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. And then I think uh, people are asking for the pin location of, it's gate five, but if you can just send a pin location, uh, Tom, on the group. I'll try and do that. It's gate five at Nazareth. If you put it into Google Maps, it's it actually five. may not have gate five, but you just drive around to if the I, If I may, five. yeah, I think you could send them directions on the group. It's quite easy to get to. Good, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank everyone you. else. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks.